Okay. All right. All right, everyone. Hi there, I'm Tracy Ford with my colleague. You wanna introduce yourself, colleague? Hi, my name is Erica Bridge Ford. We are staff with Community Mediation Maryland, and this is our third installment of our series called Mediators and. So our first one was Mediators and Neutrality. Our second one was Mediators and Humility. And this one is Mediators and Social Justice. I don't know, we just randomly picked this topic, no reason in particular. <laughs> <laughs> no reason at all. No reason at all. <laughs> um, yeah. Everything's going crazy. March I mean, maybe just 400 years of stuff is why we are having this conversation, perhaps. I mean, if you talk about race relations in uh, America, yeah, 400 years. But if you're talking about, you know, being a woman, being poor, being, uh, um, you know, an immigrant, we're talking about uh, four, yeah. 400 years here and then forever. Forever um, years. Forever, right. forever, yeah, yeah, so... It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. And this, I think this is a, it's really hard. It's a really hard time. And my fear right now is you going to say something that's going to make me ball on full well that I don't have a cute cry. Like, <laughs> it, it, it impresses and irks me that you have the kind of cry and you're able to talk while you're crying. But if I cry, that's what I'm doing. Like, that's all I can do when I'm crying is cry. So it's not, it's not, um, yeah, it's not, it, it doesn't make the revolution look attractive when I cry. <laughs> so, okay. Well, so. I'll, I'll try my best not to, not to get, not to trip you up. I got more fire in me today than anything else, I think. Because that NPR interview started me off this morning right. with all the fire in me. So I think that's a, that's a good place to start off. So like, talk about, as a mediator, what what does your social justice work look like for you right now? Um, so for me, I constantly struggle with this idea that, um, you know, if you are neutral in times of injustice, then you are a part of the problem thing. I know I'm not saying the quote right, but you know that thing mm -hmm. that, right? Um, and so I think about it like I have different roles and responsibilities. So when I'm a mediator, so in times of injustice, there needs to be people who are committed to being the bridge, right? And so if, so for instance, right now we have uh, if we just take Black Lives Matter on one side of the bridge and All Lives Matter on the other side of the bridge, you know, or Blue Lives Matter or whatever the other side is, right? Okay. That there's this, <laughs> right, people are yelling from each side, but there's no bridge. Right now, there's just a big, gigantic gulf, right? And people are yelling right. Black Lives Matter from one side and the others are yelling, you know, Black people need to just listen to police from the other side and everything would be fine. And plus, yada, 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 Barack Obama, racism is over. You know, like there's, those are the different sides of the right. goal. And then, so what they need is a bridge that comes in and says, oh, y'all are trying to have a conversation and the way y'all are doing it is yelling positions at each other. We are people right. who know how to listen to positions, help everybody feel heard and understood and help be a bridge so that where you want to, you can find those places to figure out what justice looks like together. You can see each other's humanity right, right. together. You can understand each other's sides and experiences together, right? Whatever that stuff is, there needs to be a bridge there because right now there's just a goal. And so when I'm a mediator, right. I'm functioning as a bridge and I'm not taking a side. And so no matter how much I agree or disagree with a side, I recognize that if I'm a bridge and I start taking a side, the whole bridge then tilts like this and then everybody falls into the gulf, even the people that I agree with, right? Mm -hmm. So my role in the mediator or facilitator space is I'm, I'm just a bridge. It doesn't matter how I feel about the, the issues. 
when I am in, um, and, and that is social justice work. Right. Right, right. And I, and I think that as mediators, we forget that being that bridge and providing a space where all voices are heard and everybody who disagrees with each other fiercely gets a chance to have those conversations and decide what justice looks like moving forward together. Um, I think that people don't understand how much that is the work of social justice. Because you can't change things until you understand the side that you vehemently disagree with. Um, and so, so that's my mediator role. But then in my activist role, it does look like a lot of things. It looks like me showing up to say, hey, I understand that although I will not destroy buildings and, um, and other material things, I do understand how when human beings have been broken and burned for centuries, how when things erupt, some buildings and some windows, you know, like some stuff is going to get broken where people have been right. broken and burned for centuries. So although right. I may not do it, I better understand that other people will feel that way and those kind of things are going to happen. Um, and so in my activist space, I'm not advocating that people should be doing those things. I am in a space of compassion and understanding about why, and I'm understanding how important it is when those things happen that we all pay attention to, well, why is that happening? Why is that their reaction? Why do we value buildings more than we value lives? Um, and so, and then I'm being called to still be the, while I, while, while I have compassion for it, I'm in the middle of blessing murder spaces on Saturday and I get a call, hey, can you come and, and be a voice to tell people, yes, they have a right to express their pain and to find ways to do it safely. And because I'm really five years old in real life, I just was like, oh yeah, sure, I'll come talk to some people. Did I not realize that I was being called to City Hall for the mayor's emergency press conference, right? And so I get there and I'm like, oh, oh, I didn't realize this one was happening, right? And so I'm being, I'm, I'm having compassion for when violence is happening in the protests, the, the authentic violence, not the sensationalized, some people was just trying to start some shit violence. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm also, using my voice and my platform and my credibility or whatever it is that people believe in when they see me and hear me talk to say, hey, everybody, yes, we should be angry. Yes, we should be hurt. Yes, we better express all of those things. And can we find that? Can we do that in a way where we actually live through this moment that more of us don't mm. get killed in the midst of expressing that pain and anger? Um, I'm helping. So the youth did an amazing um, protest right. also on Monday. Um, and they rightfully so reached out to adults. I guess we're considered elders now, Tracy. I hope you realize that because in their mind, they were like, oh, let's reach out to the elders to get advice about how we should organize and strategize. And I was like, yeah, I'm yeah. still young and slick. I don't even know what y'all mean. But I think the fact that I call myself, <laughs> well, slick you know, is why I'm old. At 65, Can everybody turn I got... their camera? Oh, that's all right. They did. Go ahead. What? No. At 65, I understand I'm an elder now. That's right. That's right. I forget. We got to age up. I forgot. So anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, you know, they were specifically what they asked of me was help with, you know, thinking through, um, how to talk to the media, um, right. about what they were and weren't doing and why they were doing the, their protests. And especially because what they were asking for was not police reform. They were asking for police abolition. So these are young yeah. people in Baltimore who believe that the entire system and structure of policing is founded on and nurtured in oppression. And so some, it needs to be dismantled and something else needs to be created in this space. And until we allow space for those real conversations to happen about that need, we're not going to get anything else. Um, and so how to talk to media about that. I also talked to them about understanding how much is spiritual warfare, not just physical warfare. So for example, calling police pigs means that you're saying to the universe, it's okay to dehumanize people. 
mm-hmm. in a space where I'm we're saying that today. Right. In a space where we're saying, well, the reason police officers keep killing black and brown people is because they don't see our humanity. We can't then also call people pigs where we're dehumanizing. Right. We can't use that same energy to try to heal it. And so find a way to say how abhorrent it is for police officers to kill us without calling police up without dehumanizing them as 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 people as well and that's a hard walk in the middle of justified anger right to notice that spiritually what am i saying to the universe as Mm -hmm. i express my anger and my pain um and so i have a lot of um and then you know people are still being murdered on a daily basis and community violence too Right. And right, so right. I'm also and then there, so there's this, always this debate when these things erupt, there's this debate about, well, where's the outrage? Where's the marches? Where's the people showing up when community violence happens? And so, like, I'm proud now that five years ago when Freddie Gray was murdered, um, there was not some community effort that people could point to to say, hey, wait a minute there is actually daily responses to when murder happens in Baltimore. It's not just when police kill us. Um, and so now people have been able, there's all these arguments and debates about, well, what about the ceasefire? What about safe streets? And what about like all of these organizations that do daily anti-violence work? Um, and so I'm in the midst of also, you know, using my voice in those conversations as well without being trolled, which is like a new thing because of technology, you know, that a part of being an activist and working towards social justice is realizing when somebody's really trying to have a conversation to understand and when they really are just there to troll you. Um, Yeah. So, yeah. And I think I'm, um, so, so there's like, you're, you're having to do this in two different, two different, hats right so there's your media hat that allows you to 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 address what's happening at the junctures in these bridges and then there's this piece of you that has to say okay my neutrality how i do neutrality won't work in this space right the mediator and so i have to i have to i have to put on a full-fledged activist hat and and make make it clear i'm not standing mm-hmm. here as a media that's I am bringing my. I am bringing the tools. I am bringing the listening tools and the values of mediation to that's this right. conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's important. I think that's yeah. important. And then that piece that you said, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm cautious because I feel like one of the, um, one of the problems that we've had with this conversation over the last four, ye- four hundred years is we make, you know, particularly when it comes to race, when it comes to gender, we. Make it the problem of the people who are suffering the most in the situation you know? that's right so when it comes to race it's work of people of color to fix the race problem but it's really not you know what i'm saying like we do have our work to do but like racism is not really you know it's, it's about white privilege and so like that's right to do. and so right. and so and at the same time as we're experiencing this to not let go of our belief in everyone's humanity throughout that feels like, how do, how do I do that without enabling the system? Yeah. You know, and, and, and I think that's, that's an important question that we, ha- we have to keep asking and that answer is going to change. Right. And the answer will consistently change over time. Yeah. Um, but but we, we can't, um, we can't ever think that we're getting into this work and we, we're in it and done. Right. And I think that conversation changes, like sometimes it shifts depending on who you are doing work with at the time or who shows up in the midst of your work at the time. Right. So for instance, yeah. the conversations that I'm going to have with white people who show up angry at a protest and so they want to pick up a brick and throw it might be a different is definitely going to be a different conversation than the one i'm having about or with people who 
say on social media, oh, they're having a protest in my neighborhood this weekend. I'm going to make sure I'm locked and loaded when I get there. I wish they would come through my neighborhood. Right? You know, mm-hmm. like... Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And and I really appreciate it. I've been listening to you, uh, your training videos that you've been doing with um, folks. They're in Minnesota. Is that right? Yeah. Um, around, around using inclusive listening in their work because it, uh, one of the videos is, um, listening when it's hard. Is that right? Yes. Um, and Kayla, could you, could you post that one too for folks to listen to? Cause I think it's really helpful. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I think that's just really an important tool that we need. Like, yeah. I think that I, I don't know. I don't know how much of it is true, but you know, the word is that we're a very polarized cu- country, you know, and I, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying it genuinely. I'm not sure how much of that is really true and how much of that is just a really um, um, convenient tagline for the media. You mm. know? I, I do think, I do think we, you know, we're, we're, we're not given a lot of good choices. Yeah, and a lot of good choices. And so when you're given with a, a, a bad ch- choice and a worse choice, um, it, right. it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make for, it, it looks like you're polarized, but you just really didn't have enough choices. That's right. Um, I know for yeah. me, in, in terms of my, my social justice work as a mediator, puts me in those a lot of the bridge a lot of the bridge work so I'm I'm doing a lot of conversations with um I love referring those to you I'll be like oh no 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 that's Tracy that's Tracy that's Tracy oh you need a, a whole community conversation where everybody is mad on all sides yeah let me give you Tracy's email <laughs> <laughs> actually let me give you her phone number because she will answer the phone <laughs> yeah yeah and um <laughs> Erica takes great delight in doing that because she knows I never go into those without a good chunk of whining. I <laughs> and I complain the whole time, and they are some of the most transformative conversations I've had in my life. Um, the relationships that um, that I've developed as a result of, of being in, in that I know are lifelong and yeah. transform me as a person, and they're hard. They're really hard because. Um, I, I looked up that 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 passage you talked about around neutrality. It says the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who, in times of great moral crisis, maintain their neutrality. Wow. Where um, and um, our colleague, the great Kiwana King, um, the great, the great Kiwana King. She 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 was. We were working on. <laughs> the language around neutrality. I'm challenging myself because I have this way of looking up at the ceiling when I'm thinking and I'm trying to convince my eyes to look right at the lens <laughs> when I'm thinking. But uh, she was challenged, we were, we were trying to come up with different language um, that was more accessible and captured these times besides neutrality. And she said, um, what did she say? Oh, I'm, I'm trying to neutralize my judgment. Mm. neutralizing my judgment which I think better captures the activity that we're doing because yeah. the truth is our judgment is not helpful in that time right yeah. I think that um that people come in anticipating being judged and and so they come in with their dukes up I don't know if people still say that but they come in with their dukes up they come up with their walls up they come in they ready. come in ready to throw hands is what they right. say these days. Right. Okay. They come in ready to defend themselves. Right. And that happens at the expense of hearing the other people's experience or other people's experience. And it, it becomes a barrier to us building this bridge. Right. Yeah. Being able to work together and, and create. Because I, I think at the end of the day, we are have very similar ideas of what this heaven on earth would look like yeah right and we're not 
we're not allowed to we're, we're not allowed to at any point think that we're going to be able to do it without each other right you no know? so um for me, my activism looks like, um, because I'm doing these larger conversations um, and I need, you know, like I, despite being Facebook streaming live right now, I a lower profile, <laughs> to keep a lower profile. So when I show up at these meetings, like there's not a recognition of the name Tracy Ford. And so there's um, greater confidence in my, in the belief about me being able to neutralize my judgment right and um and so when i'm not at the mediation table or i'm not facilitating my activism is my home so i i work mm. my home a safe not safe you know being you know because it's still a black person's home so there's we know that black women can get killed in their house um right um so um but I work to make my place an emotionally safe space. Yeah. Able to come in and it's, you know, my house is kind of a train house. And I'm able to, my sister came out of mute, uh, out of mute just because, because <laughs> the, the question that you asked me, if you hadn't seen me in six months, you're the first question people ask me, so who's in your house now? Like who lives? Right, right. And uh, I have had over 50 housemates, um, this from c cradle to, you know, to now. My first, my first roommates were my sisters. Um, <laughs> but um, I feel like people get a chance to kind of get their bearings and learn from each other. You know, I've had people who um, from all over, over the world, people from Egypt, people, I say all over the world, people from in the United States, American members, uh, uh, volunteers, mediators, not mediators, people I make mediators. You, you live here long enough, I'm gonna make you a mediator. Just so Absolutely. You know. <laughs> but if you come but, through um, my womb, I'm gonna make you but, a mediator. <laughs> yeah, Erica has three generations of mediators in her family because uh, she made her mother be a mediator, all three of her children, one of her brothers a mediator, two cousins yeah. a mediator. So, but uh, me, you, you just, you just, you know, you just stay in one of the rooms for long enough, and I'll have you in a mediation training. But um, and for me, it's about sharing this language of the inclusive mediation model, which is the model that we use. And having, because when we take away violence as an option, violence is a language. Violence is a language. And so when we take away whatever people are trying to communicate through violence, we have to put something in its place. And so whether you're mediating or not, the inclusive, the inclusive um, listening process can be a replacement for that. And people can use those skills as mediators to communicate what it is they want and need from their community. Right. Uh, it's question guys. time. Ronis, it's question time. Okay. So, are there questions? Do you have any on Facebook? Y'all better um, put questions. I have hope said green vouchers may need some large group facilitation. What is that? Who might need large group? People in green belt might need oh. some some large group facilitation. So if you are with us on Facebook or on Zoom, this is now time to ask questions. So you can type your questions into the chat if you're on Zoom, um, or you can unmute yourself. Don't turn on your camera, but you can unmute yourself to ask a question on Zoom. And on Facebook, yeah. you can also type questions. I'm watching the Facebook feed as well. Right. There's like, what, 30 folks in here, so I know there's some more questions. Um, and I will say, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased, one of, one of the many things that impre impresses me about this community is, you know, when it happens, when it hits the fan, the phone rings, our phones ring, and you're like, okay, what can I do? What do you need? Right. <laughs> um, and I love, I love that. There, uh, I, I've had, like, this week, this week alone, like, three mediators who have been inactive, 
are like, I'm ready. I'm ready, coach. <laughs> right, right. Good. We got work for you. We got work for you. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm halfway jealous of folks who are saying they're bored because I'm looking for some boredom because it's been busy. Boredom busy. is not ever a thing over here. Not, not in heart. Right. You know, and that's, real, that's something too about... Um, I th and I think being a mediator has helped to teach me this thing about what to do when the world is on fire and looks hopeless. Mm -hmm. Because in the face, like constantly as mediators, our work in the community mediation movement, we're constantly saying, where is there social injustice and where do relationships matter in healing those injustices? And the answer is right. in all of them. <laughs> right, right, right. right. And all the social injustices, relationships matter if you're going to heal them. And so we are constantly doing the work of finding ways to build relationships and build understanding and ha having quality processes for people to have hard, horrific, you know, gut-wrenching conversations with each other, not just for the sake of having those conversations before mm. the, the, the sake of then deciding now that everybody's voice is heard, what do we want to do about it, right? Um, and right. so because we're constantly doing that, we don't get less busy when shit hits the fan, right? Because normally we're going, hey, call us if you need to have conversations about race. Call us when your parents and teens aren't getting along. Call us when right. co-parents aren't getting along and disagreeing about parenting. Call us when you think your landlord is a slumlord. Call us when, like we're constantly saying, like you got a complaint with the police. Hey, we got police complaint mediation. Like we're constantly doing that work. And people are like, oh yeah, that's cute. I don't know if talking is really the thing that'll work for us right now though. So I mean, yeah. and then yeah, some buildings start burning and they be like, oh shit, ain't there some people around here that know how to bring people together who don't like each other? And so we don't get less busy. A pandemic hits and everybody's told to stay in the house and we go, Mm, people gonna be in the house together. They probably gonna be angry now. Right, like, right. you know, they gonna realize how much they don't really like each other. Things they were able to not talk about, they can't not talk about now that they're stuck in the house together. People might need some conflict management training. Let's do that. Um, my cousin asked me this morning. Um, so so I, I, uh, what I wanted to say about it before I go into that is, I, I, so what I've learned in this work is, when in times of, of um, upheaval, because we can feel so hopeless automatically, I start focusing on, well, what am I able to do? What can I do? What do I know how to do? So that I'm not just reeling in the anger and pain and, oh my God, not one more time another Black man did at the head at the hand of police. You know, like, I'm not only focused on that, I'm also able to go, all right, what can I do, you know, right here in my lane? Um, and so my cousin was also saying that, like, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, why are pe why does it seem to be uh, people more in an uproar all over the country now about what happened to George Floyd? Why does it seem to be like everybody in every city is having a protest? And I don't know that we've seen that level of uprising all over the country before when somebody was killed. Um, and he said he thinks it's because it is happening in a pandemic. It's happening at a time where we don't have any choice but to look at it. He said now he can't go and dance his pain away. He can't, you know, dwell on the murder of George Floyd for a few days and then go back to work on Monday. He can't go right. to a bar and drink his pain away. He can't go to a restaurant and eat his hurt, right? And none of us can. We have to just be like, oh, this is actually, we got to be in it. And so then people go, well, if going out to get toilet paper is essential, how is going out to protest not essential right now? You know, like... <laughs> And that's the, you know, right. people have to choose for themselves, thinking about like right. COVID versus protests and gatherings. Like you can only make the best decision for yourself right now. So I understand people who say I'm staying home because of COVID, but I, and I also understand people who say, 
I'm going outside to be in this protest because of social injustice. So I want, um, so a couple of things with that. One, I, I love to hear folks put in the chat or chat or mention there on questions Facebook, on Facebook, ways, by the way, ways that you, what your activism looks like right now. Let us know what your activism looks like right now. And so I want to, oh, sorry, go ahead. All right. Let me just say about the green belt question that I, yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. And, and it can, <laughs> like green belt is a really interesting situation for folks who don't know. Green belt, Maryland was, um, a very intentional community largely built by people of color, mostly African American, and then they were not allowed to live there. Yeah. You know, so, you know, like we talk about this being incident related, but, you know, when we say it's 400 years, this particular conversation has needed to be had and had well, we're serious. And so, when I ask people to come to um, conversations, uh, community conversations, I, the first question people ask me are like, okay, how long will this be? How many sessions? And the answer is we, we have to converse until, until right. we finish. And so like the first time I did this, I was young, I didn't know any better. And you know, we, we, we said eight sessions. And so then we moved eight sessions. We had just started getting into the work. We eight just, two hour sessions? Eight two hour, eight three hour sessions. Eight three hour sessions, okay. And so we went from that to it, it was we we were meeting for 18 months. Right. Reading. And so it's we we have to talk until we're done. Yeah. So let me um, grab these questions in the on Facebook. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so one question she's, she's from, from, from Talia is how is social distancing impact and mediation? And a question from Hope is how do we replace the language of violence with something else? What is the something else? Okay. Let's this um the Talia's question is quicker. So we have we have moved um we've moved mediation to an online format. Um, mediators across the state have been, community mediators across the state have been doing training so that they can um, provide this tool in an online format. And I just want to emphasize that it's temporary. So don't get used to that <laughs> because mediation is built and meant to happen with people at the table face to face. And if you are a mediator and you haven't had access to that, um, uh, contact yeah, our, you can go to our um, our our website mdmediation.org, and and they'll get you in touch with me, and we can well, get a picture and a mediator. Um, and then to Hope's question, I do feel like the language that we use um, in inclusive mediation, the inclusive mediation listening, and reflections using inclusive mediation are can be translated in everyday conversation and can be a replacement for violence. So, you know, like a lot of our language is violent. You know, when we're, when we're announcing, we're telling people who they are, you know, not even just slurs, but when we're telling people who, who, who they are, you're irresponsible, right? You're a cheater, you're a liar. That's violent language, right? As a what it is that you want, what's important to you, right? So I need us to parent in a way that reflects responsibility, all right? I need our communication to be grounded in honesty. Right, right. All right. Um, I need I to need see follow through. When we say we're gonna do something, I need us to do right. it. And if something happens that impacts that, right. we should talk about why it needs to change or why it can't be done right now. Right. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So. Like, so Instead like, of going, you just don't give a shit about these kids. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it's so tempting because we're seeing at every levels our elected leaders defaulting to a violent language. That's right. Right. So we're saying, you know, we are a small grassroots non for profit saying we can do better and this is how we can do better. And you know we're we're pulling you in to help us spread the good word about better and encouraging to you to do better. Yeah. Um, 
I want to I want to capture Susan said she one of the things that she's doing for her activism is reading to inform herself about anti racism. So there's there's uh, one of the things I'm really appreciating is people um, challenging white people around their privilege and saying like it's not enough to say you're not racist. You have right. to be anti, -racist. you know, that like you have to be actively combating racism, right? right. To get to get your medal at the end of the race. Right. And you have to be having those conversations with other white people. Yeah. Right. And so there's a lot of like asking black people, well, what must I do to be saved? And it's like, <laughs> it's like um, that's y'all sickness. We didn't create the myth of white supremacy. We're impacted right. by it. But that's y'all people. Like y'all need to go and talk to each other about that. But also notice that when I think people hear the word racist and they go, I'm not a racist. And so they miss all the places where they absolutely say and do racist things, although they may not live a racist life every day. Right. And mm -hmm. so noticing that we are all white the myth of white supremacy has been the most successful marketing campaign in history. And so noticing how all of us are impacted by this belief, even just something like when you see a group of white men in suits walk down the street, nobody clutches their purse, nobody walks to the other side of the street like, oh, this might be a gang of people who are dangerous. But let a group of black boys in white t-shirts and saggy jeans walk past you and it's a different reaction. And that is because there's been a great marketing campaign that says that white men in suits especially, you know, are safe and good and valuable. Meanwhile, they kill more people around the globe every day than black boys and white t-shirts and sagging jeans will ever be able to do in their lifetime. Um, and so it's important that we all unearth the places in us where we have been conditioned to believe that there is something more valuable about whiteness. My cousin said today that he tells his white friends, white people shouldn't just say black lives matter. Like black people can say black lives matter, but white people need to say something else. And what they need to say is white, white black lives are equal to ours. And then Ellen G said, right, white people need to say black lives are just as valuable as white lives. And he was saying the difference is because he said white people, their dogs matter to them, their yards matter to them. <laughs> you know, things matter. He said, it's not that black lives haven't mattered to them. He said, our lives mattered when they brought us over here on ships to build their country. Our lives mattered. Right. They fought a whole civil war because it mattered to them that they were able to be able to use our lives how they wanted to. So it's not that black life doesn't matter. They put us on the front lines of wars to this day to shield and protect them so we can, our lives will, will be the first to fall, but our lives matter to prop us up to get killed first so it's that so white pe our lives have mattered to white people for a very long time it's just that they have gotten to decide how to use our lives and how our lives matter to them without ever considering that our lives is are just as valuable as theirs yeah. And, that's it. and so those are the conversations that white people need to be having with each other how do I either and or, right, participate in and or benefit from a whole system of things that automatically assumes that my whiteness is more valuable than everything, everybody else's skin. Right. I want to, I want to add to, well, I, I want to add to a little bit to the conversation that Hope brought in about like what, what it looks like to replace our languages, right? And I'm, um, I have an invitation for everybody towards the end, but before I get to that, I wanna check in. Claire, I, I didn't quite understand your question. Can we make space for those difficult conversations between folks to see that feel so polarizing? Claire, do you mind coming on or just unmuting yourself and asking that question again? Did she ask that yeah. to you privately? Cause I don't see it in the group chat. Oh, maybe, I don't know. I might have, but I thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanna also just say thank you so much for bringing some of the connections together from the work as to how to, to navigate the conversations that we're having on a daily basis that aren't specifically in mediations. But I guess the question, it came up because there is an incident recently where there was a, a racial uh, attack in a community that 
I am close to. And there's been a lot of discord between people, um, not discord, there's just been a lot of unsettling and, and hurt around what has occurred. And I know that there is a restorative solution and a restorative practice that can be put into place to fix this and build the community back again, but being so closely attached to it, I'm curious as to how to bring that topic of conversation up or to see the solutions around it in a place where I think people are feeling attacked and judged on both sides. Does that clarify? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so one of, one of our tenets in, in, in community mediation is around constantly giving feedback. So like feedback doesn't just happen when stuff is going wrong. It is like the thing that we're always doing, right? And, and, with the, as, and receiving feedback as a gift. And we know that not everybody's doing that, but the thing that we're always doing is making sure our, our feedback is honest and respectful. So I'm listening, to, um, I'm listening to Erica on the radio this morning in an interview. And uh, she's, she's asked, she, she'd been um, approached by the young people that she mentioned earlier, and they're asking her for advice about what to do. And she gave them advice on how to handle the media. And so she's on the media telling them about how she told <laughs> these children how to handle the media. And she says, because the media will, what was the word you used? The media will um, hijack, hijack. Will hijack, hijack your message, right? So she's on the media telling the media how you handle the media because the media will hijack your message, right? That is honest. <laughs> and, you know, and she didn't, she didn't call the media names. She didn't call the reporter names or what have you. This is, you know, this is who you are. Y'all ain't no good or anything. But she's, she talked about her experience and the experience of people of color. And so being able to sit in those spaces that you're, you're talking about, Claire, and giving that honest and, and respectful feedback about how you see people performing. And know that when you do that, there will, there will rarely be an applause afterwards. So one of the things that being, um, being an activist means is that you are going to be making the space uncomfortable, right? And that may make you uncomfortable um, and unpopular and and you will feel isolated and so find 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 your spaces your people that you can go to after you do that work but make but challenge yourself to consistently do that work um er, erica and i are not the favorites of the mediation world you know like we're because we are freaking saying stuff that um the challenge, the norms about what mediation is, about who mediators are, and um, in, in a way that combats um, our or combats, you know, systemic oppression. And the thing about systemic oppression is, it is institutionalized, and it is it, it gets to def it has been able to define what's happening. And so, uh, when you you know, it it feels like punching a brick wall with your bare fist sometimes. And wow. so that's why I advocate the self-care, but I, I require that we be willing to make the space uncomfortable, that we be, be willing to disturb the rule, because there's a lot of stuff that we have to tear down before we can start building up, right? So you, you frequently have to blow up things before you can start building beautiful things like bridges. And so Absolutely. be and, and be, be willing to be held accountable. Um, you know, I, one of the things that, that I find distasteful a lot in, in, the, uh, in the, the words of our, our elected officials these days is they're going in, they're doing stuff, and then they deny that they did the thing that we saw recorded. That's what, that's what blew our minds about um, Aubrey's killing, about um, uh, George's killing. <laughs> video we see you right now what is happening and you're telling us that wasn't a murder that that was you know that was self-defense like you at no point were you in danger right so when you go in and you tell people what you're doing is participating in, in systemic racism and you're enabling white privilege don't get afraid and run from that right. later all right you know you are going to be vilified to a lot of people 
please be willing to stand in the center of that because that's what people, minority groups have to do all the time. We have to sit in that, you know, because sometimes just our presence highlights for folks the ways that they're partic participating in systemic oppression, the way they're, yeah. they're um, kowtowing to their privilege and, and they get mad at us because we showed up, yeah. you know, and be willing to sit in that and to, to acknowledge and honor it. I also want to add, like, I think one way to help people, so outside of like a whole restorative dialogue process that you can all absolutely call Tracy or email Tracy to do for you, <laughs> <laughs> is like in these, in these daily conversations with people, like really ask people, would it be okay with you if somebody was saying that about your child, about your brother, about your uncle? If your family was in this grief right now, would it be okay with you if people were saying the very same things about your family member as they're saying about George Floyd? So for example, one of the favorite things to do, so when, when a white man, let's just for example, when a white man shoots up a church or a mall or a school or whatever, immediately there's all the conversations about, oh, something bad must have happened to him when he was growing up. Let's check in on his mental stability, his emotional stability. Oh, and then all of this stuff comes up about how he was traumatized growing up and that's what created this monster that showed up one day and killed however many people they killed. And it's not that that's not a valid conversation to have because absolutely that's how monsters get created, right? Except that when daily violence happens in black communities, that's not the conversation from white people. The, the conversation suddenly is, oh, they just don't care about each other, but they're mad when police kill them, but they'll kill each other. Never stopping to go, well, wait a minute. Don't you want to have that same conversation now? What happened? What trauma happened in this person's life? that led up to the day that they then killed somebody in their community. Why is that not still the conversation suddenly? And if it's happening in large numbers in the Black community, what does that tell you about the amount of trauma that Black communities must have already been in that in people's minds, murder is a lot of times the choice that they feel like they have to make? How did that get created, right? or even when somebody is murdered by police officers, right? So George Floyd is killed by police officers. Everybody realizes it's a murder. And instead of sitting with that and calling it a murder and deciding that justice needs to happen because a man was murdered, instead people want to deflect and go, oh, but I think he was a drug addict though. I'm sorry, bitch, what? So that means that it's okay? Did he get killed? Like, if your son was struggling with drug addiction, right, and gets killed by a police officer, not in the middle of, he wasn't in the middle of robbing somebody or putting somebody's life in danger or anything. He said he couldn't breathe, so they had plenty of opportunities not to do what they were doing to him. If your son, your uncle, your brother, your father, is struggling with drug addiction and ends up being killed by police officers, would his drug addiction be the point of his murder? Like what, in the midst of that grief, would it make sense to you for people to start debating, but he was on drugs though? What is the though, right? The though, is black life is not as valuable as white life. And so when black life is taken, we should start having a conversation about, well, what kind of person were they? It doesn't matter what kind of person they were. They shouldn't have been killed in that moment that day. We don't know what kind of person they would have become. And now they don't have a chance to because somebody decided that it was okay to take their life today. Right. And I, I think um, an important piece for us as mediators, the space that we want to be making is a constant conversation, an, on, an ongoing conversation, because um, we're, we're too quick, we're very easy. Like, we will protect 
the peace that we have in that moment and, and run from the stress of having the hard conversation. And we've been doing that for 400 years now and, and it's, it's not getting better. It's not making it better, right? And I, myself, I, had, I have to challenge myself in this because I, I realized a couple of years ago, like if you're on a scale of one to 10 of like anger, I have to be at like a five or a six for me to do something. If I'm not at a five, I will, I will protect my peace and I'll be like, you know what? Never mind. Never mind. Oh, that's good. And so we have to challenge ourselves to get outraged to like not, not succumb to the numbness. Um, one of, one of the challenges of the Baltimore ceasefire is don't be numb because we hear about this so much. Right. And now that we have you know, this social media and every, everybody is a reporter. Everybody has a chance to be Ida B. Wells. Make sure you look up Ida B. Wells. Everybody has a chance to be Ida B. Wells and report what is going on in, in terms of lynching. There's this, there's this, um, this danger that we have of going numb to it. And so we have to challenge ourselves because the numbness is the way of protecting our heart right. is the way of protecting Heart, right and we need to we need to relinquish the the temptation to protect our heart and let our heart feel outrage yeah and let outrage motivate us to have these difficult conversations yeah. and even while they're difficult using our skills as mediators to have this conversation well right and yeah. so it's tempting to use this as an opportunity to take out our revenge you know like a lot, I think a lot of trolls, I haven't been trolled, but I, well, I got trolled one time, but a lot of trolls, they're taking out their revenge from some other area of their life. They're taking it out using a platform where they feel like they can win, yeah. right? So what our temptation will be to, to engage in these conversation and exact revenge, you know? And if you're one of those people that can come up with a witty quip, if you, if you got, you know, if you can, um, throw out insults quick fast and in a hurry like this oh this can be a prime time for you but yeah. the important thing right now is what what's the change we want what's the change and for and to, to challenge to be that change all right ultimately what is the world that i want to to live in and my i want my children to grow up in and my grandchildren preceding generations to grow up in and so i have to start doing that now yeah. i have to start being that person right now yeah. And I, I really, to, to, to um, repeat what Tracy was saying about going back to our YouTube page to watch the training about listening when it's hard to, that training is also talking about how we listen for feeling words. And we probably need to do a training about speaking to be heard and how you use the inclusive listening stuff to then speak, right? Because mm -hmm. a piece of it in the way that we listen is we're listening for the really hard feelings. We're not just going, oh, so you're concerned. Oh, so you're frustrated. We're going, oh, you're horrified. You know, like, like the, you feel betrayed. Like you, you want to be really naming the hard feelings that are easy to run from. And I think that when it's time, for, so, so as a mediator, we know how to listen for really hard feelings coming from other people. But then in using these skills, when we're talking in these hard conversations ourselves, when we're going, oh, it's a part of my responsibility to disrupt, you know, the, the systems of oppression and the, the conversations that nurture the, the myth of white supremacy. How do I do that without just calling people a racist fool? Like, what, else, what other language is there? Um, and so naming your emotions. So as Tracy pointed out, naming your values, right? Instead of calling people liars, you're saying honesty is really important to me. And I would love for our conversations to be grounded in honesty and being transparent with each other. Instead of saying you a liar who never, and the truth ain't in you. Same thing, right? <laughs> when we're really angry or we're really hurt or we're devastated or we're afraid or whatever, right? Being able, so I'm watching like white people on my timeline talk about the conversations they're having with their family members and how right. just exhausting it is when they hear their family members say things that just make them cringe. Like, no, I don't want to be white no more. Y'all, y'all white, I'm not. 
Um, <laughs> so instead of, you can't turn in your white card, you know, congratulations and sorry, not sorry. But like what you can do is say to your family and your loved ones, like, like I feel really afraid for what we are perpetuating in our family, the example we're setting for the young people in our family, when we say, but George Floyd was a drug addict though. And when we say, but what was Trayvon Martin doing in that neighborhood? And when we say, you know, like when we say, but those black people, but black, just calling it black on black crime is a problem, right? And so like using your feelings to, to really express Here's how I feel when we say things like this in our family um, right. or, or in our workplace yes. or whatever, like right. using your feeling words. And so, um, so go look at that, like listening when it's hard to, so you can understand what we're saying about feelings and values specifically and the importance of listening for them. Cause it'll also help to clue you in on, oh, I can talk this way as well. I can speak from my own values and I can speak from my own feelings. And that will move me away from violent language where, people only feel attacked and blamed by what I'm saying. People are still gonna feel uncomfortable and they're not gonna like it. They're gonna feel very disrupted. <laughs> but that's the that's different from saying that you were, were attacking them with your words. Um, it, is, it is three minutes past stop o'clock. So Erica, if I can get the last word, I wanna say uh, the last thing is an invitation yeah. and then we'll, uh, we'll stop. Um, so I, I live in Baltimore, have lived in Baltimore for uh, 22 years now and um, have been really motivated by the ceasefire movement. And so I've, it's given me a way to volunteer um, in a, separate from my work as a mediator or, or to bring my skills as a mediator, but separate from my work at Community Mediation Maryland. So as part of my volunteering and work as a Baltimore City resident, I am going to be volunteering to put together um, an opportunity for Baltimore residents to pick up this new language. So I will be providing, working with other, other volunteers in Baltimore City um, as part of the ceasefire movement in 2021, we will be providing 20 hours of inclusive listening training to 1,000 Baltimore residents. That is just amazing. I can't wait so to see how you do that. <laughs> right. Uh, my, the goddess of my calendar is gonna be helping me with that. <laughs> and, um, and so what that means is we, we'll, we'll be continuing the work of replacing the language of violence with the language of community building. Um, so so that's that's part of the work so that that if i can let that be the last word for folks who are with us on zoom we have um the links to our previous videos on chat please uh join um become one of our subscribers on youtube our channel is cm maryland community mediation maryland c cm maryland spelled out and i think we have like 12 videos on there and um, and I think a lot of you are already, uh, what's the language, friends? Friends on Facebook? Facebook friends, yeah. Facebook friends. So um, please check those out and please leave us messages um, in the comments about other videos you'd like to see us doing. Thank you all so much for your time and your questions and your input. And we look forward to you for the, the next chat. Yay! I just put in there um, this message about uh, on July 12th at seven o'clock, we're gonna be, me and my cousin and I are gonna go live and have this conversation that he calls the Santa Claus problem. <laughs> Which cousin? Cause you have 745. Buttons. Buttons. In, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so 745 we're be, in this zip code, so. Yeah, yeah, so we're gonna be talking about why, why, why black lives already matter to white people and still there's a, this problem.
Um, so awesome. on July 12th at 7 p.m., we'll be live on the Baltimore Ceasefire Facebook page. You can also go to BaltimoreCeasefire.com to see the calendar at Jul on July 12th if you want to join on Zoom. So we're going to, it's like now, right? We're going to be live on Zoom, streaming live on the Facebook page, and then we're going to upload it to our YouTube page. So if you want to participate in that conversation live, you can um, join us on July 12th at 7 p.m. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yay. Thank you all so much. All right, good people. Enjoy the rest of the day and we look forward to um to seeing your comments. Yay. All right. Um